I pray that we'll all be ready when Jesus comes. And you know, the time is drawing nigh as the world is in a turmoil and things are happening that uh, uh, we would never thought we'd see in our lifetime. But it's appropriate that God has allowed that. We talked earlier about injustices and justices, that we are talking today about wisdom and wisdom's gift to us as well as the, uh, it's uh, her rewards. And it's amazing here on this Father's Day that we will be talking about wisdom and wisdom labeled as a she. And it is normal for our wives and our women to give us men the better of the situations when it comes to making choices of right and wrong. So with that said, my beloved, my beloved I pray that we'll all be ready when Jesus comes. Now, this is June 21st uh, in the year of our Lord, 2020, Lesson 3 uh, for June, and, it, and the international lesson title is Receive Wisdom's Gift, and our adult lesson title, according to the Boyds, is Wisdom's Rewards, and our reading will come from Proverbs, the eighth chapter, which is our background scripture, as well as parts of Job, but our lesson text scripture is from Proverbs, the eighth chapter, 8 through the 14th verse. And then it'll skip over to the 17th through the 21st verse. And if you have your Bibles or your Sunday school book, I invite you to read along with me now in the King James Version. And it reads as follows, my beloved. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing for it or perverse in them. In them, they are all plain to him that understandeth and write to them that find knowledge. Receive my instruction and not silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. I personified, I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way and the forward mouth do I hate. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. And then we go to the 17th verse. I love them that love me. And those that seek me early shall find me. Riches and honor are with me. Yea, durable riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold. Yea, than fine gold. And my revenue than choice silver. I lead in the way of righteousness, in the midst of the paths of judgment, that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance, and I will fill their treasures. And our key verse, what we would call the memory verse, comes from Proverbs 8, 10, and 11. Choose my instruction instead of silver, knowledge rather than gold, for wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Well, my beloved, I thank God for the uh, introduction of these things in the scriptures, and our lesson outline will be divided into two parts with subsections of th two to three parts. The first part is divided in Roman, uh, in, I'm sorry, in Proverbs 8, 8 through 14. Wisdom's words and the subcategories of those, verse 8 and 9, based on truth. Wisdom words in verse 10 and 11 is better than riches. And verse 12 through 14, wisdom words are bringing discernment. And then the second part of the outline uh, covers the remainder of the lesson, Proverbs 8, 17 through 21. Wisdom's wealth, wisdom's wealth promised to seekers, verse 17. And wisdom's wealth is providing real treasure, verses 18 through 
21 and then we will conclude by asking a question and saying a prayer and giving a thought to remember. So without further ado, my beloved, let's get into the lesson, The Many Faces of Wisdom, or as Boyd would say it again, Wisdom's Reward. Okay? But before we do start, let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for how you have blessed us and is blessing us, Lord. We acknowledge you for who you are and whose we are. We bend the knee and we raise the open hand to you, O Lord, submitting to your will, Lord, asking you to give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of your doings and your goings and your comings, Lord. And help us to understand and have knowledge and have wisdom to not only learn better, but to do better, O Lord. Father, as we go into this season of prayer and this season of learning, I ask that you would touch the leader of our country, President Trump, that you would touch him from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. Lord, help him to have wisdom, Lord, wisdom in his mind, wisdom in his heart, not just wisdom for self-gratification, but wisdom for the people, wisdom according to your will, O Lord. And not just him only, Lord, but all the leadership that have all the jurisdictional factions throughout, from teachers and policemen to supervisors and bosses, Lord, all those that have an influence on other people's lives, fathers, mothers, give them and give us wisdom also on how to conduct our lives and how to train our children in the way that they should go. Touch our families, Lord, for we, the family, are the core of what makes a nation, Lord God, and makes a godly nation. So teach us in the precepts, Lord, of your will. Lord, I ask that you would touch my friends, even my enemies, Lord. Touch them in their minds. Touch them in their hearts, Lord God. Raise them up on a high rock and establish them, Lord, in wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And if I may be a little selfish, oh Lord, touch me in this hour of need, Lord. I ask that you would touch me in my mouth, that I may speak the things in love concerning your word. Touch me in my mind, that I may think, think soundly, thereby producing those sound words, Lord God. I would ask that you would touch me in my heart and in my will, that as I learn better, I do better, and I do obey. Father, I thank you for this, and I believe I'm praying according to your will. Therefore, with expectations, I say thy will, O Lord be done. Amen and amen. So opening this week's lesson, I just want to tell you a quick story concerning my experience uh, uh, when my brother that was next to me passed and uh, uh, we had become quite close. We've been close all of our lives as he was the younger until I came along. But to my dismay and heartbreak, uh, uh, he passed uh, just about two or three years or so ago. And in uh, doing so, uh, he had left a trust fund. And not just a trust fund, he just left an inheritance. And unfortunately, he did not leave an, an, a will with inheritance. So I had to go through probate to get everything distributed. But he did leave me as executor of uh, his estate. And with that said, I divided all of uh, his remaining wealth between the siblings and the siblings' children if the siblings had passed on before. But uh, as he left me a little bit of uh, a little piece of money, a small piece of money, uh, but nevertheless, he thought enough about me to leave me something anyway. But that's not the point that I want to uh, extract from this story. The point is that uh, he, he, he was, uh, he, he, he was a faithful Christian and he took me to church, thereby, uh, while I do appreciate him financially, that's not the most valuable legacy that he left me. And going to church, he introduced me to elders and men that tutored me since I did not know my father for quite a while. And I, I referred to these elders and, and deacons as the church. So the church taught me the wisdom that the book of Proverbs calls its readers to obtain and cherish. I became conscientious of the importance of laying up treasure in heaven. However, others uh, are not so wise. Many are extraordinarily rich in the things that will not last and exceedingly poor in eternal wealth. So here's the question. This is the question that we get from that experience and from our lesson also. How do we invest in the riches that come only through the pursuit of godly wisdom. 
How do we invest in the riches that come only through the pursuit of godly wisdom? Now, wisdom is highly valued in the ancient Near East. Most nations had wise men who held high rank in government because of their skill. Skill makes the difference. The Old Testament mentions wise women as well, as well as the wisdom of women and as uh, wisdom is personified uh, in the feminine aspect. The people who filled these positions in government and society were considered exceptional in wisdom. It seems as though today we don't want those that are wise. We just want those that will say yes all the time. But nevertheless, wisdom such as that found within the book of Proverbs is not limited to a specialized class of people. It is intended for everyone to live by and practice regardless of their social status. Wisdom do not know individuals in their status, but wisdom do know individuals in their obtaining. As a matter of fact, if we were to take lessons from uh, the animals that's described in the Bible as to them being wise, in other words, they were given instincts on how to gather and how to store and how to be busy and when to hibernate and all these things. But Proverbs describes four animals that are said to be extremely wise. And you'll find that in Proverbs, the third 30th chapter uh, verses 24 through 28. The first are the ants and, and it reads, the ants are people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. In the conies, any of various burying animals in the family that's having long ears and short tails like the rabbit and so on and so forth, uh, said the conies are but a feeble folk, yet they make their houses in the rocks and the locusts have no king, yet they go forth, all of them by bands, and then the spider. Everywhere you look, there are spider webs, aren't there? The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. They are not exceedingly brainy creatures, but they do have skills in practical areas of living. And that, my beloved, is what wisdom is. It is the knowledge and understanding that you obtain, hopefully from God, and utilize it in your practical day-to-day -day experience. Now, the wisdom God has provided in Scripture helps us to follow suit in the same manner. We take the wisdom of the Lord and we have before us the discernment of what is right and wrong, and then the Lord gives us the courage to choose what is right and follow that path. That, my beloved, is wisdom. So wisdom is far more than intellectual prowess. This practical knowledge guides us as we navigate through the life in this broken, sinful world by instructing us, one, how to act, two, how to speak, and three, how we should respond in a wide variety of situations that we may have up on. Now, Today's lesson from Proverbs continues the appeal to follow the path of wisdom that is grounded in the fear of the Lord. Now, there is one foil to wisdom. Wisdom's foil is the seductive woman called who? Folly. That's her name. Wisdom's foil is the seductive woman called Folly, whose tempting words lead to nothing but disaster. Wisdom is described again as calling out and raising her voice in Proverbs 8, 1, and then 1, 22 and through 33. And as was the case in Proverbs 1, 21, wisdom is positioned at prominent public locations so that her cry cannot be missed. It's at the gate. It should be in the courthouses. It should be in the schools where it cannot be missed. Now, let's talk about wisdom words. Proverbs 8, 8 through 14. That was just the uh, introduction that I covered. Let's go into the uh, verse by verse exposition of the scriptures now. Wisdom words, verses 8 and 9, is based on truth. Verse 8 reads, all the words of my mouth are just. None of them is crooked or perverse. Wisdom has previously described her words as trustworthy, right, and true. Proverbs 8, 6, and 7. Furthermore, wisdom's lip detests wickedness. 8 and 7. 
a similar declaration occurs in the present verse. Uh, the claim is all comprehensive. All of wisdom words are grounded in what is just. Crooked is just another synonym for perverse. The rightness of everything wisdom says excludes any falseness, even from merely twisting the truth or omitting key details. You know how we do sometimes when uh, we want to embellish a story or we want to build up something or we just want to hide some details from someone. We will tell part of the truth but omit key details. And doing that, my beloved, uh, 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 is deliberately lying, no matter which way you look at it. And what the Bible says about the rightness of everything wisdom says, it excludes any falseness. And that is twisting the truth as well as omitting key details. May I add also, it's also uh, uh, exclude denying the truth also. Verse 9, to the discerning, to the understanding, all of them are right. They are upright to those who have found knowledge. Uh, you know, though some assume that gaining wisdom is complicated, uh, a, a complicated high level pursuit, wisdom says, wisdom asserts that her ways are right to those who are discerning, that must be discerning in the church, out of the church. In other words, we are to judge, we are to see things as they are and make a determination about them. We're never to condemn because we don't have that jurisdictional or, or, or right, but we are always to make sound judgments. And remember, the way that you judge is the way that you will be judged also. So wisdom's counsel is also right in her straightforward goals. There is no hidden agenda or anything to be ashamed of when following wisdom. There is no fine print to entrap someone later. You know, you see these commercials about all of the selling of fear and all of the selling of products, and, and, but with the side effects, they have very little fine writing that's posted up under there uh, that they click on and off too fast for you to read. Well, there's no need for that in wisdom. There's no fine print. There's no entrapment. Uh, uh, if you would utilize wisdom now, you will gain her rewards later. Even the Apostle James state in James 1, 4 through 8, listen to what it says. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Here's the key. If any of you, if any of us lack wisdom, let them ask of God, and God gives to all men liberally and holds back nothing, and it shall be given him. But here's the warning, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, asking for wisdom now. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that waver is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and toss. But let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord, because why? A double-minded man is unstable in all their ways. Words that are upright appeal to those who are guided by understanding and knowledge. The kind of knowledge that begins with the fear of the Lord, according to Proverbs 1 and 7. Such wisdom, such, I'm sorry, such individuals see no need uh, to debate the worth or value of these words. They make what? Perfect sense. And the only appropriate response to the words of wisdom is to obey. As I learn better, I do better. That's correct. Now, wisdom also are better than riches, verses 10 through 11. It says this, choose my instruction instead of silver knowledge rather than choice gold, for wisdom is more precious than rubies. Now, wisdom presents herself as the first of two choices facing a person. Now, the second choice is the best material this world has to offer, represented by the precious metals, silver and choice gold. And choice gold implies gold of the finest qualities and the costly jewels of, of rubies and whatnot. The offer of such abundant wealth would be hard to refute. Yet wisdom possesses more lasting value and produces far more genuine pleasure and enjoyment than anything the world has to offer. 
How would it be, my beloved, to be of the age that you are now and have no regrets? Now, centuries later, Paul will have much to say to Timothy about the temptations associated with riches. Here's what the apostle said. He said that uh, you'll encounter those who believe that godliness is a means to financial gain. And you got to understand, there are some so-called preachers, false teachers, uh, uh, and there's a host of many others that uses the word of God, uses the platform of preaching and teaching just to gain financially. And they promise much, but deliver little also. The, the apostle, uh, uh, what he said, he declared, he countered this by saying, godliness with contempt. Contentment. Be satisfied with what you have because you could have nothing. Godliness with contentment is itself the greatest gain. And you'll find that in 1 Timothy 6, 5 through 6. And some other things in 1 Timothy states that those who set their hearts on obtaining riches are subject to many harmful desires that ultimately destroy them. 1 Timothy 6 and 9. In fact, the love of wealth is a root of all kinds of evil, 6 and 10. And if people desire to be rich, Paul will write, then they should seek the rich in good deeds, 618. So here are the questions that come out of this as we've discussed it thus far. What do you love? Do you desire to be rich as God defined the terms or as the world defined the terms? Now, what else does wisdom do? 12 through 14. Wisdom brings discernment. It says in verse 12, I, wisdom, wisdom is personified now. I, wisdom, dwell together with prudence. I possess knowledge and discretion or judgment. The father has encouraged his son. This is Solomon talking to his son now. The father has encouraged his son to practice wisdom by keeping good company by keeping good company and avoiding those who would entice him into sinful practices now we learn that wisdom herself keeps good company prudence speaks of a person who is discerning and making choices cautiously deciding what is right and having the courage to do what is right wisdom also claims to be familiar with discretion now, in Proverbs 2.11, discretion is said to protect the person who possesses it. We must not always speak our minds. Uh, you know how people say, I give you a piece of my mind. Well, some of those pieces you may need to keep because you run out of mind after a while. Okay? So, prudence speaks of a person who is discerning and making choices, cautiously deciding, courageously deciding what is right. Wisdom also claims to be familiar with discretion. Now, the present verse may be highlighted uh, wisdom's ability to provide one with the necessary insight to spot harmful influences or harmful people. When they are encountered and take steps, uh, when they are encountered, those that are wise take steps to avoid them. Now, the writer of Hebrews characterized mature individuals as those who practice wisdom so they can distinguish good from evil. That's in Hebrew 5.14. Now, this aligns with the wisdom words here. Though the wise person will be innocent of evil, he or she must also recognize evil to avoid it. And if you're living in this world and you think that you've rid it yourself or rid yourself of all the evil that is in you, you got another thing coming. Let, let me explain this for a moment. Too many times people are seeking after the wrong thing. We're seeking to break habits. We're seeking to quit this and we're seeking to stop that. And that's all good in and of itself. But I'm here to tell you, my beloved, in all of my years of learning, I got about five or six decades uh, on, on me. Uh, in all of my years of learning, and whatnot, I found out that the flesh is hard to tame. There are things that this body desires that are not good. But there's one thing that I do say. I, I have learned to quit trying to fight the things and, and stop the things. But what I have learned is to love Jesus 
better than the things or more than the things. And I find myself in a new position when I love Jesus more than I love the details and the likes of the flesh, I find myself not doing the things of the flesh. And that's the key, my beloved. Which dog do you feed the most? Which one do you love the most? The one that you love the most will grow the strongest. Verse 13, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, uh, wisdom says, evil behavior, and I hate perverse speech. The wisdom of demonstrating a healthy fear of the Lord is emphasized throughout the Old Testament. And the assumption is that a proper reverence and respect for God and his word will result in obeying God through his word. One cannot keep his commands without learning to hate evil. And the attitude cited in the verses that I've read are all sins that are part of evil behavior. Amen? Amen. And evil behavior, they, they each detract from the life of blessing that is the fruit of prioritizing wisdom over material wealth, over the pride of life. Pride and arrogance are used synonymously. This is the only place in the Old Testament where these two words occur together. Pride in particular is condemned because it stands in the way of the humble heart that the Lord both requires and honors. You remember the very first sin committed that was ever known of was the pride of Lucifer wanting his throne above God's throne. Evil behavior, perverse speech are built on pride and arrogance. Speech that is perverse goes against what the Lord finds pleasing. It's counter to the kind of speech that Paul would state later that follows, uh, followers of Jesus are to uh, demonstrate. You find that in Ephesians 4 and 29. Now, verse 14, counsel and sound judgment, wisdom says, are mine. I have insight and I have power. Wisdom continues to make her case for earning both hearing and heeding from her listeners. The blessings that come from obtaining wisdom contrast sharply with what the Lord and wisdom both hate. Now, the insight and power of wisdom elsewhere are said to overthrow entire cities, entire nations. And I'm here to tell you also, my beloved, that the lack of insight and wisdom is the fall of a city and a nation. Second part. Wisdom's wealth, what will wisdom give us? Proverbs 8, 17 through 21. Wisdom is promised to seekers. Verse 17, I love those who love me and those who seek me shall find me. Wisdom never spurns anyone who truly loves her. This verse also commends those who seek wisdom, a challenge that is included in our previous study. And preferably, the seeking begins early in one's life so that an individual can gain the maximum benefit from wisdom. And you know what true wisdom is in the youth is listening to the warnings and the admonitions of the elders. The quest for wisdom is not an impossible idealistic dream walk. It is very much in the grasp if we turn to God as an individual and as a nation. Our search is governed by our respect for God, his ways, and his words. Our goal is to know God. Our goal is to know God and his ways more fully so as we know him better, we obey him better. This is a happy joyous journey, the lifelong pursuit of godliness. Wrapping it up now in verses 18 through 21, wisdom provides real treasure. 18a, with me are riches and honor. 18b, enduring wealth and prosperity. Wisdom promises that riches and honor result from obeying her invitation. And one is reminded of Solomon's request for wisdom. God not only granted the king's request uh, but also gave him much more than he had asked for, including wealth and honor. Now, this do comes with a warning, though. Some look at the promises of riches and honor that are associated with wisdom as an assurance that material wealth and prosperity will come to anyone who chooses to obey the Lord and live by his wisdom as found in scriptures. 
other verses appear to offer such a guarantee also. But like all Proverbs, however, caution must be exercised in interpreting these as guaranteed rewards for faithfulness. I'll give you an example. The Proverbs in Scripture express principles, principles that find fullest reward in eternity and do not always result in an easy life. Nobody promised you a rose, God. One must not overlook the role in human free will and sin as it has an impact on how certain Proverbs actually play out. For instance, Proverbs 22 and 6 speaks of a child being well taught. Raise up a child in the way he should go, and when he get old, he shall not depart from it. It speaks of a child being well taught and still living in wisdom in old age. But nevertheless, yet, we all know of cases where children went astray in spite of their parents' wise teachings. Oh, here's a statement. Uh, uh, found in the Bible also. A general answer turns away wrath. That's Proverbs 15 and 1. Now that doesn't describe what happened to Jesus at his trial, does it? Even though he spoke in a soft answer, he told the truth. He gave such an answer to his opponents and yet still, according to Luke 23, they still crucified him. If we are ever troubled by circumstances, Rest assured that we're not alone. The psalmist wrestled with the same issue and came to understanding that material prosperity is only temporary. It ends when the Lord carries out his righteous judgment, according to the Psalms in 73. Real wealth is found in wisdom and is enduring, like the treasures in heaven that Jesus spoke of, where wisdom's wealth cannot decay or be stolen, Matthew 6. 19 and 20, lay up your treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust do apply themselves to it. In verse 19, he says, my fruit is better than fine gold. What I yield surpasses choice silver. The comparison with fruit goes well with wisdom's earlier portrayal as being a tree of life. Proverbs 3.18, wisdom bears uh, worthwhile fruit throughout one's life and provides invaluable insights for any age, any stage, or any circumstance of life. Verse 20, I walk in the way of righteousness along the paths of justice. Wisdom ties with what is right have already been established in Proverbs 8 and 9 as have her links to what is just in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Whether justice is understood as judging right from wrong or as practicing fair judgment in one's daily contacts and circumstances, wisdom feels right at home in the middle of such God-honoring decisions and actions. Last verse. Bestowing, verse 21, bestowing a rich inheritance on those who love me and making their treasuries full. The word inheritance highlights the enduring, doesn't it? Uh, uh, the enduring nature of wisdom's wealth, Proverbs 8, 18. It is an inheritance that wisdom bequeaths to those who sincerely, passionately seek her, according to verse 17. Now, once again, Treasuries can signify the material benefits that accompany living by the counsels of wisdom. But these are not the primary riches for which wisdom is to be known and followed. The inheritance wisdom provides is one that can be passed on to one's children, one's children's children, with the understanding that if pursued diligently, Wisdom's treasures will become just as precious and valuable to them. And, you know, some may ask, well, isn't it possible to be wealthy and wise? Sure it is. The biblical record includes individuals who are both wealthy and wise. Abraham, Job, uh, Solomon, David. But the Bible clearly warns us about the spiritual dangers that material wealth and possessions can pose. The primary issue is the impact that this has on one's heart and thus on one's relationship with our God. In the parable of the sower, Jesus warns of the deceitfulness of wealth that results in an individual becoming unfruitful after receiving the gospel. And you know that in Matthew 13 and 22. And Jesus asked this question, 
What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose their own soul? 1623 of Matthew. Of course, the implied answer is nothing. To gain all the world has to offer at the loss of wisdom results in nothing but tragedy. That's true, despite all the abundance that the whole world can offer, all these teachings are consistent with wisdom's plea to choose her above any form of material wealth. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the abundance of gifts that you provide to those who choose to heed the call of wisdom. Thank you for examples of that wisdom who have shaped us over the years. Help us to be such examples to those in our spheres of influence. In Jesus' name we pray. This is what I want you to remember, my beloved. Remember, before wisdom's gift can be open and treasured, they must be sought after. Amen, amen, and amen. So until next time, my beloved, Vivet Coram Deo, live before the I face. pray we'll all be ready. I pray we'll all be ready.